And um, in the process, I'm going to mute everybody. So if you want to pipe up or if um, I'm not sure if Danny and Drew want to allow uh, questions during the meeting, but if they do, you'll need to unmute yourself to be able to do that. I'd say, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to go ahead and start with a uh, muted anyway, and we'll see how that goes. And yeah. They can unmute themselves. Okay. Why is, why is I tell you? <laughs> hey. <laughs> How are you, buddy? Ish. Today has been a yeah. completely uninteresting day. Nothing, <laughs> nothing interesting has happened all day, so therefore I've been a little bored. I've been, I've been self-medicating since about noon. <laughs> well, that's going to help. Oh, well, you bet. Well, I think in my particular case, I'm about to self-medicate with one of these. Seems appropriate. Mm. It's my very last yeah. one. Oh. So if you, uh, if you boys want to share your screen. Uh, sure. uh, Denny, which, uh, I, I sent you a message. Which version of the PowerPoint do you want uh, me to use? Uh, short, simple. All right. Let me, let me we'll, switch over. We'll, to pow the... we'll power through it really quick so we have more time to for questions and bullshit we're really good at the bullshit if you guys haven't figured that one out yeah really that's that's our specialty that's why we have you on here january is usually a special meeting for us for uh having a kind of more fun uh crazy uh type of meetings and so that's why uh, that uh having drew and danny on for our january meeting would be completely appropriate oh, totally man we have pioneered what we call home routainment <laughs> all right uh so here let me go ahead and uh, i'll share my screen hopefully i don't mess this all up because of course it's the 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 want of every office share right there right. you go buddy aha got it amazingly i haven't screwed this up all right yeah. Vincenzo. so this is us this is what we're all about we want to make really good beer but uh we it's a it's a hobby right and that has to be the very first thing you keep in mind so this is us uh between us we have like over 40 years i'm, I'm at 23 as of march what are you at uh march uh, 99 so was that 20 uh, 22 uh, yeah i guess yeah 20 21 no, 22. Yeah. Right. At any rate, yeah, well, a bunch a bunch of years between the two of us. So we've pretty much screwed around with everything. Uh, three books, Experimental Homebrewing, Homebrew All-Stars, which if you don't have, check it out. It's, it's a really cool, underrated book. And Simple Homebrewing, which is I always like to say, simple is not for beginners. Exactly. Well, and of course, that also gets us into the, the crux of this talk, because uh, we are big believers in the idea of simplicity. So one other thing that we got going for us, uh, you may or may not be aware, of course, we have a podcast. It usually is weekly. The Ever since COVID, uh, things have gone a little bit squirrel-shaped. Uh, however, that's natural. So but we are we are doing our best to get back onto our weekly track. Um, all right. So here's one of the big things that I always think about is that fermentation, what we do as brewers, fermentation is a natural process. Fermentation is entropy captured. It is a natural thing that we then redirect to our own purposes. Fermentation is going to happen with or without us. We just want it to be able to produce something like this. So it's up to us to be able to actually control it. And of course, uh, that tends to go a little squirrely because uh, most of us, and I'm going to guess almost a good portion of the people on this call, are either engineers or somehow in a technical field. Uh, we are scientifically minded type folks, which means that we have a very bad tendency to overthink the living hell out of everything. I mean, you're talking to the guy who's setting up a Raspberry Pi so I can do some some tracking of my numbers to be able to go, oh, hey, look at this. Uh, completely yeah, unnecessary. Look, I know. Uh, it's antithetical to what we talk about. But well, we, do really. tend to, we, we do tend to overthink everything. Um, this is one of my favorite archaeological images I've ever found. This is a set of grain grinding gear and brewing gear from the Zagros Mountains in Iran from about 15,000 years ago. 
So mankind has been doing this a lot longer than we ever knew anything about how to take a temperature, how to check our pH, uh, and how to do anything more complicated. And they go, yeah, that's doing something. So and what, you, what, you don't, what you don't see here is that there was also a 15,000-year-old tilt hydrometer discovered along with it. And also what you don't see here is right next to it is one of the very first recipe sheets that Denny ever wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Touche, <laughs> touche. <laughs> All right. So this is our this is one of our mottos. Yeah, really, man. Just take it easy. It's a hobby. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Check out that goat. He's relaxed. He's having a bock. Uh, that's that's the idea. Uh, you know, home brewing is all about enjoyment of the hobby, and the beer kind of is like how you do that, as opposed to being the objective. Well, and the way I think about it is the beer is the fun bit that we get out of the end because beer is a hell of a lot more fun than making birdhouses. Um, and <laughs> and by the way, there. well, and by the way, that, that goat, that was literally one of my favorite photos we've ever taken for, for a book. Yeah. And I actually demanded to our photo editor, no, he's got to be drinking a Bach beer. There's reasons. And so they, they got a Bach beer for him. All right. So yeah. Denny. This, I mean, after after 23 years and 575 batches, this is what I've come to. I want to make the best beer possible with the least amount of work possible while having the most fun possible. Because like I keep saying, it is a hobby. You're supposed to be having fun. If you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. Uh, you know, so keep that in mind because that's the whole point of what we're doing. But when, you know, least amount of work implies simple, and that kind of means something different to everybody, and everybody gets to define simple for themselves. Right, and th this is very true, because again, Denny and I, you know, even though we talk a lot of the same things, we have a lot of the same beliefs, we still do things in a lot of different ways, right, you know, differently from each other, so it's important to keep that in mind. And, um, and always remember when that happens, that Drew is always wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Unless I'm actually right, which happens more often than you like. Um, yeah, once in a while. I have the podcast report recordings to prove it, so shut up. Um, okay, oh, yeah, that's right. So now th this this slide's a little old because when we first started talking about this, this was very much one of the one of the truths, which was that for homebrew retailers, the market was actually down. You know, all these you know all these breweries have opened around us. And of course, you guys down there in San Diego have a problem finding a nearby brewery. Uh, but all these breweries opening up around has actually kind of taken a lot of people away from the hobby. Cause why, why spend six hours making a beer when I can just go and visit Nick and go get a, a crowler or something. Right. Um, and so what retail shops were seeing was actually that their sales were down and they kept going further down the order the shop got. Uh, now, of course, recently with the Corona uh, fund happening, that's that trend has reversed a little bit, uh, but we haven't actually seen what the sales numbers are for this year. The other big bit is I'm going to guess that almost all of us who are here on this call all have the, identi the identity as a home brewer, right? You know, I mean, I'm literally standing in my garage that I've converted into a home brewery, right? I have a freaking hop light behind me. Uh, you know, if somebody asks me, you know, hey, what do you do? I'm like, hi, I'm Drew. I'm a home brewer, right? And that's just how it is. But as you know, as we move out of Gen X and we move into, you know, Z and the millennials, that's less true. They're less interested in the whole idea of identifying exclusively as a home brewer. And so we're also seeing more and more time being spent in other things like, say, kids. I don't know why, but kids, people want to spend time with their family. Um, so it means less time for the hobbies, which means that we need to come up with simpler ways to make brewing possible. Right. So, and, and so a lot of this is all about, you know, other things that you can do. Uh, so smaller batches, automation, and also really taking out a lot of the unnecessary steps, but keeping the stuff in that you love. Yeah, and, and that's the point. Um, you know, the, the more you can simplify things, the more likely you are to brew. A good example here is, you know, how many people, have you guys still bottle, right? Are there, anybody raise your hand if you're an exclusive bottler? <laughs> Uh, of course, Andy is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry for you. Um, yeah, but I mean, but again, that's part of the idea of simple. Uh, why don't you go ahead, Drew? 
uh, everybody gets to decide what they like, you know? Uh, yeah. See, Drew says I'm lazier, but I'm too tired to prove it. Yeah, right. So, you know, if, if there's something you enjoy, then it doesn't matter because it's worth whatever effort or not that it takes to do it. But the more you learn the science, the more you'll figure out what you need to worry about and what you can just let go away. Yeah, exactly. It's learning about letting go of the, uh, letting go of the, the little things and focusing on the things that gain you the most uh, value. So, yeah. yeah. All right. So in doing experiments, both between us and Brewlosophy and other people out there, these are the top things that we think that matter the most. If you focus on these things, you can strip back a lot of other the crud that you're doing. So yeast vitality matters the most, right? You know, how good is your yeast? How strong is your yeast? Less so actually than the yeast cell count that you're putting in. It's how much vigor do those yeast have when they go into the into the wort that matters the most. It takes quality ingredients to make quality beer, so don't skimp on that. You know, I know a lot of homebrewers out there are penny pinchers. I'm going to guess that most of us are in our homebrew clubs are probably not so much uh, penny pinchers, but it is there. Water chemistry is actually way more important than than I learned when I was when I was a kid brewer, uh, and so it's actually something that you do want to focus on. Fermentation temperatures, eh, yeah, they, okay, sure they can, but then again, we have people who are trying to make lagers at 65 degrees. Denny's made one. Um, yeah. And then mash temperatures, not at all. And then no, everything else. Not at all. Well, mash temperatures, any difference they make depends a lot more on the malt you're using than anything yeah. else. For most of the big commercial malts that everybody uses, uh, no, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I was going to say, with most modern malts, so take like your RAR, your Great Western or something like that, like the, from the big houses, uh, they are so enzymatically hot, they basically convert if you look at them funny. So, yeah. you know, that's the reason why they're saying like mash temperatures are a little less important than anything else. And then all the fiddly things that are beyond that, that we do, if they're fun for you, then keep doing them. My classic example of this one is uh, every time I get ready to brew, I have an all-in-one system. I take it up to the front of my garage over here. Um, and before I get ready to brew, I light a stick of Buddhist prayer incense and put that down in the ground next to the, next to the brew vessels. Does it make a difference? No. Is it part of what I do? Yep. So Andy calls me a hippie. Well, you're the one who looks the part. I'm the stealth hippie. Um, <laughs> all right. This is one of the other big things that, uh, that I, I swear by. This is part of the reason why we started yeah. talking about simplicity so much. Because inertia, the inertia of life, of everything else, gets in the way of brewing, and it kills so many brew days. At least it did for me. This was my realization. The easier the things are that you know to get started, the more likely I am going to be able to brew. And so to me, the argument is that you need to do everything possible to smooth your path to the brew day, right? Um, Ooh, I have I have I have an example of that that proves exactly how lazy I am. There you go. Uh, I, I was I I've been wanting to brew, and uh, I I have two grandfathers, right? I have the little one, the G thirty, and the big one, the G seventy, and I had the G thirty set up, and I was going to need the G seventy, but in order to do that, I had to like walk out to my tool shed and get a hand truck to move it because it's fairly heavy and stuff. Took me two weeks to get around to doing that. Uh, but now it's set up and I can brew. Right. And so, and I'll give a perfect example of this. So let me give it, I told you guys I'm standing in the brewery, right? So, Hey, I got brand new signs up there. They all have my name on them. They're fun. Um, but one of the things I did was I moved into, when my wife and I first moved in together, we moved into a house uh, that we were renting and I was like, Oh, Hey, look, I can be a real boy. Now I can, I can brew 10, 10, 15 gallon batches. That's going to be great. And when I bought the house I'm in now, I was like, great, now I have a permanent space, so I don't have to worry about this so much. Um, and so I went and I built myself a two-tier brew stand, you know, HLT, cooler, you know, boil vessel, propane burners, everything all wired together and all that sort of good shit. And it's hard to see it because it's sitting behind a bed frame with other crap on top of it, because that's how often <laughs> I use the damn thing. Yeah. But when I actually, when I created that thing, I was like, okay, great. You know, now I'm a real boy. It almost killed my brewing. Uh, there was a good portion. There were, there were at least two years in a row where I brewed like twice a year, if that. Because taking that thing out and getting ready to brew and do all the stuff I needed to made it so I didn't care to brew anymore. 
Like I would, I would start to come, uh, I would come out here and I'd be like, uh, I'm going to go do the grocery shopping, right? Instead of actually brewing. And that's the reason why, yeah, you know, I'm arguing that, you know, you need to do a lot to actually smooth your path. And that's part of the reason why I switched to like a, a all on one system. There are other things I do, uh, but uh, like big yeah. ones is get your yeast started ahead of time. I find that if I start my yeast, I know I have, I have a, uh, I have a, a clock ticking where I have to start brewing. Uh, get your water set up the night before. Uh, if you're smart and good and you trust everything, you don't have a house that was built in 1925 that you don't trust the electrical electrical system in, you can even set it so it preheats the water. <laughs> you know? So yeah. you walk outside and go, oh, look, get your grains milled, get everything set and everything cleaned. And boom, there you go. It makes it so much easier so that the next day you walk out and you're like, okay, I've got to get, uh, I got good brewing, mill the grains in, you know, or mix the grains yeah. in and go. Yeah. And, and get, if you're doing water treatment, get that in there too. So it's all ready to go. Uh, and it, it's great, man. I, I love just walking out there and having the water already heated up and ready, dumping the grain and start the mash and I'm off. Yep. And then the very last one I'll mention, and this is one that Dane and I get a lot of pushback on when we, whenever we talk about yeah. it, is uh, hold off on drinking while brewing. <laughs> because yeah. if, you, if you start drinking while you're brewing at least too early in the process, then uh, uh, shit tends to go pear-shaped and you tend to get lazy and you cut corners or you forget things. Uh, I know Denny brews early in the morning, so uh, he's got an extra incentive not to drink. Uh, yeah, but, that's right. And for me, I don't usually start brewing until about like 11 o'clock in the afternoon or morning. <laughs> true, true. This, is, true. this is Lauren. I, I used to have the, as the first thing on, the, on my list for um, um, any recipe. Um, mm -hmm. So what to do on the brew day for that particular recipe was open the first home brew. Mm -hmm. um, that stopped a long, long time ago. <laughs> oh yeah. Good idea. Yeah, I, I, but you would be surprised at the amount of uh, homebrewers, like particularly if you're at a place like HomebrewCon, you say this, the amount of homebrewers are like, you suck. Well, yeah. that, well uh, you know, for, yeah, for me, I bet. Drew, this is true. This is Andy. I, yeah, I can tell you that um, I've heard the, the expression that don't drink while you're brewing because you might get a BUI. Brewing under the influence. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, for me, for me, it was a strictly practical thing tied to my laziness because I like to get everything cleaned up before I walk out of the brewery. And if I've been drinking, it just makes the work that much harder and I'm too lazy to do that. So you know, I get started about, oh, by nine or so. Uh, my last brew session took me just under four hours. So, you know, by, by early afternoon, I can sit down and have a beer or 12. Yeah. I, and I've made the classic mistake of where I've had too much to drink on the, uh, on the day of brewing. And I come out like the, like two days later and go, oh shit, I forgot to clean the mash done. And we all know that's not fun. <laughs> um, I've but never it, actually done that, man. Yeah, and well, and so for Denny's rule is not until he's done brewing. My rule is always I don't have a beer while I'm brewing until I'm in the boil, the fermenter's cleaned and ready to go, the chiller's set, and basically I'm on the down slope, right? So the only thing I got to do is, you know, chill the beer, get into the fermenter, and then clean out the, the boil kettle. And even the boil kettle, I can leave for the next day. But as long as I do that, that's when I'll allow myself to finally have a beer. I just, I just want to say we got a bunch of great comments here. You guys are a bunch of comedians. Yeah, like I can't even keep up with it. Like, <laughs> I know. Walk, 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 I walk. know. It's great. <laughs> and, 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 and of course, the coronavirus is the worst. Uh, okay, let's move on, shall we? Sure. All right. Um, now, there are going to be a lot of people out there like who really like their complicated me method, like uh, I, all you uh, all you folks who are addicted to doing lambics and barrel aging and all that sort of stuff. And you guys have a reputation. Couple decoctions and all that yep. kind of crap. But if you like your complicated method, your complicated method gives you the things that you enjoy at the end. I mean, look, the Society of Lambic beers are fantastic. So the effort that you guys are putting in there obviously pays off. So if that is a thing that you do and it works for you, Thumb, uh, thumbs up, bud. Yeah, you got I, it. I, I it's, it. it's actually a simple, the, the Society to Lambic, it's actually a simple prop for us to make it, but that's because we do it as a club. Right. You know, so the, the, the most complicated part is getting all the cultures going and all that kind of stuff. And, but mm -hmm. because we do it all as a group, 
it sort of spreads it all out. So, you know, in that sense, it is kind of a, a, a simple brew day when we actually come in and brew. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, and then, but again, there are lots of people who are, you know, just sort of, they do something silly. And like Denny pointed out, I have a friend of mine who he never wants to make a Pilsner if he's not doing at least a double decoction, um, which, which is always like, to me, it's like, oh, why are you doing that to yourself? Um, yeah. But it makes beer they enjoy, so I'm not gonna I, I'm not gonna shit on his beer. And, and if you, I mean, as far as Drew and I are concerned, the best reason to do a decoction is because you enjoy the process. But if you enjoy the process, go right ahead. You know, mm -hmm. it, that's up to you. That's your idea of a simple brew day. No, no, no. I was gonna say the best reason to do a decoction is because you got a couple of dumb noobs over that you want to torture for a little while so you can <laughs> sit there and drink beer. Here, stir for two hours, idiot. There you go. All right. So simplicity and technique. Um, uh, Denny, this is all you, man. Well, you know, it, it's just like, look at what you're doing and think about if you need to do it at all. And if you do, is there another way to do it that will produce equal results? Uh, when I started brewing, I fly sparged about two batches, uh, read about batch sparging from George Fix, started doing that. It's like, whoa, this takes me like 15 minutes instead of an hour and a half. And the beer turns out exactly the same. And then, you know, in, in more recent years, um, you know, the, the whole no sparge thing has happened. It's like, yeah, that's if you can get do that for a beer, why not? There is no difference in the beer quality doing that if it's the right beer. Oh, sorry, typing a comment. All right. So uh, <laughs> this was one of the other ones. Uh, so big thing that uh, big thing that started to happen particularly when the the younger set of brewers is doing smaller batches i'm um, i don't know about y'all but uh, you know most of us older brewers when we got into the hobby it was like you know go five gallons or go home you know like you know why why are you why are you spending your time doing anything less than five gallons it's going to take you the same amount of time what a waste of effort right um but here's what we've seen in the market that's happening is that people are out there they're in apartments they don't necessarily have a dedicated brew space they don't necessarily have you know a place where they can store all this stuff so smaller batch brewing is less space intensive it's less expensive to get started uh and it's also a hell of a lot more friendly because there's less stuff that you have to move around and actually surprisingly for um, everybody saying you know it takes the same amount of time it doesn't so yeah that's right yeah i can i can knock off a uh two and a half gallon three gallon all grain batch probably less than two hours doing a, a 20 minute mash and a 20 minute boil works great now, this is a, another one of mine um this has been a big bugaboo for years you know there are people out there who will tell you that extract beer sucks and it turns out extract beer doesn't suck uh it just tends to be that most extract brewers are new and so therefore they haven't uh they haven't figured out exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And so as long as you're using fresh extract, you can make really fantastic beer. I've known brewers who they've been brewing longer than I have, and they still use extract. And you know what? They make damn good beer. As long as you understand its limitations and you do what, uh, what it can do. Um, the picture that's here, this came at the end of a brew of the Falcons day when I had some leftover water in my HLT. Uh, and I, and uh, when I was brewing, and that's the big rig actually there in action. And when I brew on the big rig, I tend to just heat up as much hot water as I can because I'd rather have more hot water than not enough. Um, and so I just, uh, I took it and I took, uh, took the remaining HLT water, put it into my old boil kettle. That's my original boil kettle from when I first went all grain in 99. And uh, swirled in some Pilsner extract and some rye extract, hit it with some lactobacillus and some other uh, cultures, let that sit for 48 hours or so and then you know boiled it two days later and made beer out of it and was it the world's most perfect beer nope but it was five additional gallons of beer that i did in 10 minutes so uh extract does not suck all right denny oh yeah man this is this is back to kind of what i was saying you know uh, brewing a bag a great very valid way to brew especially if like you're in a hurry you just want to get a batch cranked out 
uh, I started screwing around. Is the next slide about the 2020? I don't recall. We'll find out. Yep. I hope so. Yep. No. Starting to get. So, it's starting. Yeah. So so a 20 minute mash, 20 minute boil for a three gallon batch on my stovetop. I ended up with 75% uh, efficiency. Um, I discovered that you need to increase bittering hops by about 50% to account for only boiling them for 20 minutes. Uh, I've made uh, probably half dozen, at least maybe 10 batches that way. Great alternative if you're in a hurry and you have the itch to brew or you just need to crank out some quick beer. All right. Also, thermofins. Uh, actually, either a thermofin or my alternatives in there. there uh, Lava Works, I think. Uh, Lava Works makes a good uh, cheap instant read pro probe thermometer as well. So uh, make sure you, uh, you get one yeah, of those. I, I finally broke down and bought a thermopin. So. Yeah, here's the here's the 2020 thing. So, uh, you know, it, it's easy to do. We'll send you guys a copy of this if you want. So we actually have to talk about it now. Yep. Well, but uh, I mean, I would also think it's important to talk. I mean, like it, when we were down in Australia, we saw a lot of people doing Maruna bag. We saw people talking about oh, yeah. other things we're going to do uh, down there. This is a technique that is fantastic for getting people into the hobby. Uh, just to agree with Kurt real quick, uh, I, I, Denny and I both prefer brewing a bag for smaller batches, not like five or 10 gallon batches. I yeah. think those are people who need like insane arm strength or a winch. Um, and so to me, like just from a safety and, and, you know, ease of use setup, I like brewing a bag at like about a maximum of a three gallon batch. And, you know, if you're doing a three gallon batch then Hey, guess what? Induction burners that you can buy off of or uh, induction burners, burners uh, that you can buy off of uh, Amazon for what were they? 50 bucks. Um, yeah, I think that was about it. Uh, are fantastic for doing a three gallon batch. So there you go. Um, all right. Now here's where, here's where we go into the idea of trading some uh, dollars for your time. Um, and I've already seen a couple of people in the chat talk about all in one systems. Denny and I are both big fans of the grandfather systems. Yeah. Uh, they are, and Denny, you just retired your, your, your whole traditional cooler. Yeah, stuff. man. My, uh, for uh, at least the last 15 years, my cooler and propane burner have been set up in the center of my brewing space in the garage. And about two months ago, I realized I was never going to use them again because I love brewing on the grandfather so much. Uh, I mean, you know, it's like I called that old cooler system the cheap and easy, and it really was cheap, and it was really pretty easy, too, but it ain't grandfather easy. So, uh, right. well, you know, but, but again, that's it's why also, I like, but it, you know, if you can afford it, it's worth the money. Yep. Yes, and Derek, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, rest in peace, Pico. Uh, actually where I'm yeah. talking to you guys from, I have uh, two Pico systems on the other side here and I haven't fired them up since the company went down because uh, I'm not sure I want to actually go through that. Uh, Chris, uh, for the grandfather, you said, ah, you'll do a mash and boil uh, and the mash and boil in the larger system using the grandfather to start with the water. Uh, I would also say if you're going to, if you do want to do grain, uh, grandfather with a bigger batch, denny has been playing with the, the G70. Oh my God, the G70 is amazing. I had to get the micro pipe work with it for it so I can uh, do smaller batches because it is such a design improvement over the original grandfather that I don't want to brew on anything else. It's probably uh, uh, G70 versus brew tools. I don't know. I don't know anything about brew tools. I just know I love the G70 and it performs mm -hmm. flawlessly for me. So yeah. I mean, here's the thing is like all, all of these systems, uh, I mean, I've played with a Robo Brewer, Bruzilla, uh, Grandfather, and one other that's escaping me at the mo at the moment. Uh, but I, the Grandfather to me is the best constructed and the most uh, the most complete of those systems. Uh, however, it's also the most expensive one. So yeah, you know, it's it's a little bit of a trade off. So you can find, and I know a lot of people also uh, swear by the anvils. But hey. It's, it's where I mean, we are. There's Yeah, there's lots of them out there. Uh, it's the concept more than the exact system. Check them out and find one that works for you. Yeah, and, and Justin's reporting that the Brew Tools is more expensive than the G70. Oh, boy. Um, 
So now I will say that one, one of the things, one of the big things that we got to push back on, and particularly when uh, Pico first arrived on the scene, was a lot of people saying that's not brewing. And I'm going to say, uh, you're still the one that's actually making the beer. If you go into any of your bigger craft breweries, if you go into any of your big lager breweries, uh, they're not doing everything manually. Uh, home brewers are weird about manual labor, aren't they, Denny? Uh, yeah. I uh, was sorry. I'm I was I was checking the news. I, I, I apologize. Stop checking the news. Shit's okay. weird. It's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Um. But yeah, I mean, it, it, I think uh, Denny, you usually say that homebrewers are like one of the few hobbies you've ever run into where people believe that harder work is a better product, right? Or something like yeah, that. Yeah, man. You know, especially especially like on uh, on uh, Facebook, you run into that attitude all the time. Just the other day, a guy told me I wasn't a real brewer because I didn't build my entire system. I was, it's like, well. No, but fuck, at least I make my own water. Yeah. And, you know, also, you know, how many people grow their own grain? All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, here's the, ca the case I'm pointing about these all in one systems, why we traded money for, uh, for the simplicity. Uh, I have a full time job, and that leaves me absolutely no time to brew with. Uh, Denny is retired, and I keep him running around doing shit, so he has no time yeah. either. Um, and then not to mention I'm old and feeble. You're definitely feeble minded. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the systems, the, I think one of the biggest things that actually converted both of us, when we actually first started using the Picos, I'm pointing behind me that you guys can't see, uh, was the fact that we could set up a batch of beer and go do a load of laundry, go clean the kitchen. Go or hey, look! If I really wanted to make my wife happy, I'd go clean the bathroom. Yay! Right? And, it works. It works. And you know the fact that we could do that sort of stuff is like, oh, I can still brew, and I can also still do things that keep things copacetic, right? And actually, still get shit done, right? So that's, um, you know, that's kind of the reason why uh, why I like it. Um, all right, simple yeast, Danny. This is all you, man. This is uh, this is something that. Uh, turned up on the AHA forum a, a few years back. Uh, you know, I've gone through all the, uh, the phases of making starters for liquid yeast. Uh, and so I've, I've really started to appreciate the quality and variety of dry yeast these days. Uh, a lot of my brewing is done with dry yeast. Uh, the, yeah, some things you can't get very well in dry, like a Cezanne yeast that Drew approves of. Uh, but a staff lager 3470 or a Lollaman diamond lager, you can make ales with them. You can make lagers. You can make lagers at ale temperatures, whatever you want to do. Uh, liquid, yeah, more variety, more effort. Uh, I always feel like if you're making any beer that starts over 1040, you should uh, make a starter for your liquid yeast. Uh, um, you know, aeration, who knows? I, I drew yeah uh drew likes to can uh wort in advance he pressure cans wort so he's got uh, starter wort always ready to go uh i'm i uh i'm too lazy to actually take do that in advance and make my life easier so yep there it is See, he's got one right there these are fantastic i could make a starter in five minutes after i sanitize the growler come on Actually, the main reason I don't do it is because my kitchen is so small. I don't have any place to store a pressure canner if I got one. Store it in the brewery like I do. Mine's right up there. Um, my, mine's full up. <laughs> Fine, be that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, and Kurt, you could save wort from a previous brew, but then you have a time limit on it. Uh, the nice thing with canning is that uh, canning, I mean, I've, I think that's the, that jar I just showed you guys, I canned back in April. And it's been sitting here yeah. in my garage and it's perfectly you can, safe. You can freeze it, but then you have to reboil it. So that doesn't really gain you much over just doing it from scratch. So, so anyway, what I was starting to say is uh, I discovered the shaken, not stirred method for making starters. Uh, you know, I've gone through all the phases of uh, starter addiction and, uh, you know, I, I was, had gotten to the point where I was mainlining a stir plate and uh, yeast calculators and stuff like that. And really, you know, wondering if, you know, if like half a billion cells was really going to matter or not. 
So this guy came along on the AHA forum and uh, he'd done a lot of research on his own, just kind of as a hobby and seemed to know more about yeast than most people I've ever met. He advocated this method where you uh, put one quart of 1035-ish wort into a gallon container. And it's important that the container be four times the size of the amount of wort you put in. Shake it until the container is full of foam, pitch your liquid yeast into it, let it sit 24 hours later, pitch the entire thing when it's at high croissant. And, and it, it works so well that I no longer know where my stir plate is. And I haven't used a, a yeast cell calculator in five years. Uh, it's oh. taught me that cell count isn't really what matters. It's how healthy and active your yeast is when it goes in. And well, uh, the other thing is uh, th this guy sacrifice, excuse me, Drew. Um, I wrote about you can go to our website and read his blog there but he's got a a paper he wrote called yeast is like a nuclear explosion or something like that and his point is that within about an hour or so of pitching this one quart shaken not stirred starter into your wort you will have a approximately as many cells as it would if you had gone with the, the the whole stir plate thing and it's healthier because it's fresher you didn't go through the whole stir it up for a few days refrigerate it decant it all that kind of stuff and i i have really found that to be the case in practice right and the one of the uh, backings at least for the san diego folks uh, is we were in Australia, we were sitting in a pub around the corner from the conference we were attending. Uh, Chris White was there and he was giving a talk. And I think what uh, he, he did a whole talk about uh, pressure fermentation, right? Uh, pressure, pressure fermentation, yes. And what he had to say convinced me I'm not interested in doing it, but that's right. another subject. And so uh, we sat down and uh, we, we told him he had missed our talk early in the day because he was taking care of business. Uh, but uh, he we sat down with him we were enjoying some salt and pepper shrimp and some pints and we told him about the whole stuff that we'd learned with the shaken not uh, uh shaken not stirred starter and you know how we were telling people this message and oh my god you know we were like half thinking he was going to think it was sacrilege and then what do you say he said he looked at me and he said you know that's great homebrewers are way too hell wait home blah, blah, blah. homebrewers are way too hung up on numbers yep so there you go. You got some approval there. Um, all right. Simple water. We said earlier that water matters. But the problem is water chemistry is tough. And I don't know about you guys. It took me years to even actually start to do it and decide what it was. that. Oh, no, I really should do something about this. Um, and the biggest thing is uh, we uh, we trust in the in the gospel of Martin Brungard. <laughs> uh, yeah, no kidding. And so uh, Martin has a spreadsheet out there called Bruin Water. It makes this all very simple. It's a very complicated Excel spreadsheet. But once you actually you know, start to figure it out, yeah, and you can go and listen. I had a podcast where I actually had Martin walk me through the spreadsheet and set it up for my water profile. I may have been cheating. And, and there's, a, there's a good a good chapter about using it in, uh, mm -hmm. in simple home brewing also. Mm -hmm. But it, I mean, I have found that it's so accurate that the only time I ever break out my pH meter is the first time I brew a beer, because I know that I'm always going to be getting exactly what Martin tells me I'm going to get. Yep. And so our big thing is don't do the stupid, uh, uh, you know, oh, hey, that's the water they have in Munich. That's the water they have in London uh, type thing, because <laughs> um, that that can often lead you astray and you never know where the hell those numbers are actually from. Instead, really go and look at what it is that you want from a color perspective and a flavor perspective. Yep. And then, uh, Danny, you always like to start with doing what the minerals for flavor, right? Yeah, right. I always look at it as a two-step process, and I, you know, I say that because a lot of times when I'm answering questions for people, all they seem to be concerned about is pH, and there's there's really more to it. I start by adjusting the minerals to get the, the kind of flavor in the beer I'm going to want, the sharpness, the roundness, the mouthfeel, whatever. And once that's done, then I take a look at what those minerals have done to the pH, along with the grain, of course, and then adjust pH up or down as needed from there. So pH is actually the... Uh, the second one, the second thing I look at. And then, of course, the other one people want to really, 
you'll notice that people want to simplify numbers a lot. And so homebrewers have fixated on not only things like, you know, GUBU and, and that, but also chloride versus or sulfite versus chloride. And that's, that's good, but it's not as indicative as you want, right? Cause it's still TDS still matters, right? You know, the, the amount of mineral you have in there still matters. So you still have to be careful. So don't. Yeah, and I, obviously ratios uh, can lie. Two to one is not the same as 200 to 100. There you go. All right. Next. All right. And if that's even too much for you, this is what we, uh, this is what we recommend. You can learn what your water does. Well, for instance, here in LA, I know that for mo most of the year, the, uh, the water here favors, uh, favors amber beers. So I, I also know it also has a hell of a hell of a ton of sodium in it, uh, which means I got to be a little careful when I do pale, pale beers. You can stick to that, right? That's fine. If you do nothing else, and the reason why I have this in big goddamn print in here is because this is the <laughs> biggest thing I have run into with every homebrew club, every tasting I've ever done, is the number of people who do not remove the chlorine or chloramine from their water. Literally, if you do nothing else, remove the chlorine and chloramine from your water, either use an activated charcoal filter now or an RO system, but remember, in order to remove chlorine from the water, and most of our districts are not using chlorine because of the length of the pipes we go through. Chlorine requires that you restrict your flow through a, a fresh carbon filter at about a gallon per minute, at least for the home size unit. Um, chloramine, which is what most of us are using in our metro systems because of the pipes, requires a flow rate of 0.1 gallon per minute. Uh, through your your fresh carbon filter, which is really, 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 really freaking impractical. Um, and so I just use potassium metabisulfite. And it, a, little, a little sprinkling of potassium metabisulfite into my water. Uh, chlorine, uh, chlorine boils off and gases off. Chloramine does not, which is the reason why most of our longer, uh, longer pool water districts use it. Um, so I use a little bit of a, a Campton or potassium metabisulfite. Don't use sodium metabisulfite unless you have low sodium. Uh, but it basically binds to the chloramine drive in and allows it to kind of precipitate out of solution and you can move forward. All right. Or you, can, others? Just have a, you can just have a hundred foot deep artesian well like I do. Yeah. Shut up. Um, <laughs> all right. So these are the other things I do. Uh, so one thing that uh, a lot of people don't talk about and uh, we've talked with other homebrew authors about this sort of stuff you go and you look at like you know your your homebrew books out there and like look we've got you know 50 recipes in here beers you can brew um the truth is it's and it's kind of the dirty secret is that a uh, good number of those recipes in those books have not necessarily ever been brewed right yep yep um don't ask us to name names Yep. We won't tell you if it's Randy or John or who. Or Gordon or anybody else, but we can tell you yep. there, there are people out there who are doing that. And it's fine because of what a lot of them are doing are exactly what we do as well, which is, you know, you know, beer recipes that you, that work for you in certain realms and then everything's a tweak, right? If you have enough time or if enough time and grade, so to speak, you can, you can understand, okay, well, if I, if I replace that care stand with a little bit of this, it's going to have that impact. That'll be fine. Um, and you can kind of predict where it's going to go. So these are some template recipes that like I use. These are mine. Uh, they're slightly different between Denny and I, particularly here on the pale. Uh, so, you know, like I like a combination of pale, Munich and crystal 60. I think Denny, you just start pale and C60, right? Yeah. And I'm leaning more towards uh, C40 these days. Right. So, you know, that's yield basic uh, pale ale. Every pale ale I make is probably based in a tweak off of this, right? And then I go. Uh, Saison, huge surprise. I've got a template Saison recipe, but this is uh, this is the one that I that I use a lot. Uh, this is the one that I uh, that I use actually mostly to test uh, Saison yeast. Also, uh, uh, point of note, you'll notice that Drury sign there in the background. Uh, that Drury sign is now lit and right up there. <laughs> and it's joined by a couple cousins. So uh, Denny's going to scoff now that I've done that, but whatever. Uh, yeah, white sugar. Is, white sugar is just table sugar. Um, all right. 
stouts are a pain in the ass for me for whatever reason i have a hard time making them so this is uh, i use this as a stout recipe all the time and just sort of you know tweak it a little now dang you want to take us on the closing thoughts yeah yeah because this is this is the zen part here um focus on the clearest path to beer that satisfies you think about your average brew day what you do what you like what you don't like what you think you may be able to do differently what you might be able to leave out so st start there and then you know and then the path will become clear grasshopper <laughs> yeah and again clear uh, clear the mental roadblocks to brewing, brewing that's exactly what i was talking about earlier with like inertia like so much uh, so much like the number of times i've come out here in the brewery where i didn't necessarily do as well as i should have about cleanup or i've been out here having a few beers and i've left beer glasses scattered everywhere or i came out here and i started to sanitize different things that need to be sanitized and i didn't finish and that's just actually like blocked me from brewing do that <laughs> right also very 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 much look at what you're doing in your process figure out if there are things you can skip things that will still make your beer good and will actually you know free you up right and again those are the keys keys are also up in like slide number three or so uh but that's where we're at this is all of this talk is all about not necessarily telling you that the weird shit that you're doing or the more complicated ways you're thinking about things are, are wrong but they are about trying to get you to focus on what are the most important things to do because the thing that actually makes you the best brewer is actually going and brewing yeah the more time you brew the better a brewer you're going to be and what you're going to find is there are going to be things that you incorporate into your brewing as sort of base knowledge just assumptions that you make yep. and it turns out those assumptions are correct and they actually will get you to where you need to be and it's all from just brewing so do everything you can to make it that you're going to be more likely to brew right. Hey! all right hey. thank you guys um do we um have questions from the crew questions comments rants why we're wrong why we suck why you're awesome why i just why i'm always right and drew isn't that's amazing yeah why, why i just spilled half of the uh, or uh, not half but a couple of the uh four pack holders i have from the falcons happy hours uh, yeah. by the way so, um, that's a lot of four, uh, four that's a lot of four pack holders there's a lot of four packs so Drew, Drew, I, I got I to have a question for you. Sort of comment and a question. Mm -hmm. And what it is is that what I've done over the years is I've tried to simplify my brewing process just because, you know, it, it, it takes effort, it takes time. Mm -hmm. And certain things like, like I don't, I, I've got the process uh, done now so that I don't have to lift any, any uh, anything that actually mm -hmm. is filled with beer. I'll lift empty kegs, but I won't lift full ones so that I'll be pumping things from one place to another. And I'm, and, 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 I, and I think I've shortened the time down a little bit too as well. And I'm wondering if as you just kind of go through and brewing uh, in your process, if you've just sort of found little things that you adjust or tweak or so that you, so that you, uh, um, you, you save time on the brewing process. Yeah, I mean, and I think some of this goes into like uh, some of what like Danny was talking about with the the twenty minute or thirty minute twenty minute uh, mash and boils, like where you start to realize that like uh, I mean like I've switched almost exclusively over to just doing single infusion even with the grandfathers, uh, for instance. Uh, the other thing that I started doing where if I'm not doing an IPA, and it's during you know say the summertime or uh, and my well water or not my well water but my my uh, Denny's got the well Denny's well water <laughs> yeah. Denny, yeah Denny's Denny's got the well it's always at fifty degrees yeah um, I, I've got uh, Southern California groundwater which uh, as you all will know uh, I mean like sometimes during the summer I'll come out here and I'll measure the the temperature for my tap and it's like seventy eight eighty and it's like yeah that's useless. Um, so like one of the things I started doing is I started doing no chill brewing and for a lot of beers, other than say like my IPAs, 
uh, I find no-chill brewing works pretty damn well. And the other advantage it has is uh, it shaves like another hour off my birthday. <laughs> yeah. And just come back in the morning and go, here's your yeast. Yay. Um, but yeah, that that's a, Nick, there are other beers that are not, they're, they're not IPA. Come on, buddy. Um, but no, it, like, I think what you have to do is you really need to look through your day as you're going about it and think about it from an analytical point of view, which is also the reason why I say don't drink during the day. Um, and actually just look. And so, and sometimes it's just a matter of also, uh, doing the thing where we said exchanging some money for some time. Right. So like, for instance, uh, with the grandfather I have, since I don't have 220 here in the garage, cause 1925 is garage and I don't want to burn it down. Um, the uh, you know i went out and i got an extra heat element to speed up my boil and and you know bring my temperatures up faster uh, another one that's actually kind of goofy is another uh, berry uh, uh, for water chemistry stuff right you know like when we're doing things like measuring out lactic acid and whatnot uh i used to have like a small set of beakers to be able to do everything with and i'd uh, uh, like fiddle and do all this other sort of shit and I finally just went and I got a set of measured syringes, like oral blunt oral syringes that, okay, oh, I need eight milliliters of lactic acid and did that. And that sped up that part of the day, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and even the other thing I did was uh, at one point in time, I had a mill that, I, that I'd had for 15 years. And I liked the mill, did a good crush. But for whatever reason, that that bastard started sticking on me every time. So, like, it took 30 minutes to get through crushing the grain as opposed to what should have been, like, a 10-minute process. And so after months of trying to figure – actually, sorry, years of trying to figure out why the thing was sticking, I finally just replaced it, right? But it is really about going in with an eye towards, you know, hey, what's causing me pain and where can I possibly improve? (laughs) Yeah. Right. And yeah, there there are uh there are 220 G30s, uh but again, I don't have 220 here in my in my garage. And that is a fantastic option. Uh and Keith if the the thing is if you're looking for if you want to do a 12 gallon brew, you get the the G70. Yeah. Right. Oh. Um Yeah, uh, did that answer your question, Andy? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think so. All right, perfect. Yeah. Uh, just back to the G70. They've, they've really improved a lot of stuff about it. The, the pump, obviously, the whole heating system, and most importantly, the hop filtering system is like freaking amazing. So, uh, yeah, if you're going to be making 12 gallons, get a G70. It's uh, really not all that expensive for what you get and how easy it is to do. be aware that to lift the grain basket takes uh, two people or a hoist or just you know treat it as your deadlift session for uh for your workout <laughs> yeah we get get 32 pounds of wet grain in there man and then try and lift that sucker uh up over your head that's just a shoulder press come on that's military press come on <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and you're you're 25 years younger than I am too. That's true, but I also have really cool things like uh, old-fashioned uh, bottle openers, like this one. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, that's badass. Looks like you could actually <laughs> cut somebody with it. So all before right. we just babble away all the time, anybody else got an actual question? Well, I, I guess I have a question. You have this fancy equipment that you used mm-hmm. for years in the early days, right? Now you're down to really simplistic stuff. So, so you invite a brand new you know, brewer to teach them how to brew and you, you know, you're brewing on your really simple stuff and they go, well, what, what about all this stuff? You know, what, what are you going to do with it and why do you have it? So really what's your answer to some of your the, previous the, the, the answer is that it's fun to have, but you don't need it. Uh, well, know? or uh, my, uh, if I'm my, teaching, go ahead. go ahead. No, no, you finish. Uh, I was going to say, if I'm if I'm teaching somebody to brew their first batch, we're going to be in my kitchen doing a partial boil extract batch, because I firmly believe that's how what you should do. You should learn to walk before you run and run before you fly. Uh, 
I know that all grain can be really simple, but I want to get, when I'm teaching somebody to brew, there are principles that I want to get across and not have to deal with all the grain stuff right there. I've taught enough home brewing classes to different groups that I have really come to believe that that's the best way to go about it. Yeah. And if you're, if you're looking from, if you're looking from a Myers perspective, that kettle I was just holding up, uh, the thing I would do if I was teaching people would be just do a brew in a bag. Brew in a bag. Yep. Simple. Uh, and I've done that actually around here for uh, for a couple of years in LA. So brew, uh, would, brew in a bag I is would just do, way. I would do an extract of steeping grains first. So they would see that. And then after one or two of those, then you move to brew in a bag and say, okay, this replaces the extract. But, you know. Well, it's my philosophy. You can have your own, even if it's wrong. Well, but here's the thing. I actually don't think it don't think you're wrong. I think because the, the important lesson out of doing extract first and extract with steaming grains. So extract with steaming grains gives you the it gets you the introduction to, oh, I gotta do something with grains. And then the real the real strong point, the real strong message out of extract with steaming grains is learning how to deal with your fermentation and your sanitation. Yeah. Which is super important i think i i still encourage people even in the stay of brew a bag and just throw it in the pot of your stove i still encourage people to actually start with extracts so they can focus on what it means to get a good clean fermentation first and a good clean packaging and then go into uh into the rest cleanliness does need to be a focus right oh god yes yeah. good lord yeah. <laughs> just a little yeah. Drew, there's a question uh, on the uh, chat board from Richard Schneeberger, um, and the oh. question is, how about yeast, nutrients, and whirl flock? Is it worth it? Uh, whirl flock, I, I still put into the beers, I and mean, I'm not entirely certain if it's just superstition and habit. Um, the I, only time... When I forget, I think I can tell the difference, but okay. I think I can. Uh, Denny has a more refined palate than I do. Yeah, that's um, true. But uh, the, at least on the yeast nutrients, the only time I ever mess with yeast nutrients is really if I'm making, uh, I'll do it sometimes with my starters, right? Like I'll put, I'll put a little bit into the, into the starter wort, but the only real time I normally use anything about yeast nutrients is when I'm doing a meat or a wine because they're, mm. or cider, because they're, they're needed. Uh, you, you can't, you can't do those without those. I, I try to remember them every batch. I definitely put them in every starter. I try to remember them every batch. Uh, sometimes I space them out. But it, it's a, especially important, I think, if you're going to be repitching the yeast uh, more than a few times, uh, at least according to the people who know more than yeast about me, tell me that uh, that's the best reason to be using yeast nutrients. And, you know, I consider it cheap insurance, but I don't freak out if I forget. Yep. And uh, hey, Denny, on the G70, the minimum batch size is eight gallons with the micro? Uh, six. You can do six. With the, with the micro pipe work edition. With the micro pipe work, yeah. All right, there you go. All right. Uh, and let's see. Uh, so in Fizzler is saying, do you guys ever brew at a more relaxed pace so as to enjoy the art of brewing? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, that's, I mean, that's all, that's all I do. Well, I'm not. I mean, <laughs> The thing is, is that like, so when I do with those brew of the Falcons days, they turn into like 12 hour days, not because I'm doing anything super complicated, yeah. but just because I'm just sitting back and I'm enjoying the actual, uh, the, the act of brewing, the act of being with my friends. You guys remember what it was like to be with your friends? It seems like a mystery. Oh, now. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, you're, you're assuming I have friends. No, where is that? Not really. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, when, when I'm in situations like that, but I mean, a lot of times, actually, when I'm here, uh, when, when I'm here at the house and I'm brewing by myself, you know, I've got other things that are going on and like, I need to get back to, you know, like helping my wife out and doing this, this, that, and the other. And so, yeah, a lot of times, a lot of times when it's uh, just that normal sort of brew day, yeah, I'm, I'm going for speed slash efficiency, but I also don't sweat it. I'm not, I'm not trying to speed run it. Like I'm trying to go through, uh, you know, Super Mario Brothers, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do what I can do to get like my brew day in like four and a half hours or five hours that are mostly unattended, right? Yeah, I mean, for the last year, I my brewing has been extremely relaxed. Uh, ever since the world slowed down uh, and there weren't as many obligations, 
uh, before that, it was like this constant stream of people sending me ingredients to test or equipment to test or something. And I had to brew. It like became almost a job to homebrew. And that's why I get so contemptuous sometimes, mm -hmm. <laughs> but well, you know, so, and that's, and that also is why I started getting my focus back to the enjoyment side of homebrewing, because I'll tell you between doing, between doing that, you know, Brewing so you can do things for other people, writing books, writing magazine articles, doing podcasts, that kind of stuff. Home brewing can get to be like a job, and it really shouldn't be. So once I started reminding myself that it was all about the fun, I started thinking maybe I need to start reminding other people that's that's the whole object also. Yeah, this is also the reason why that Danny and I have never made the uh, the horrible decision to open up our own brewery. Mm -hmm. Um, chance. unlike some people on this call and uh, Denny you should hold that uke you know just like because people are noticing it wait no no put it the, 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 no, a little more forward come on oh there we go we can barely see your face now that's perfect we can barely see your face great <laughs> so we we've heard a rumor that um Denny does play the, that ukulele once in a while I would say play yeah. is generous and I would say I would say that I would say that once once in a while is way overstating it. Okay. Yeah. yeah well, I, I, I have, unless, well, I have been strumming Paper Moon in the background. Uh, well, thankfully, you're, well, thankfully, the mic hasn't been picking up, um, oh. except for just barely. Uh, no, if you guys want a, a true horror show experience, uh, oh God, no, Christmas Island. Yeah, go, go, yeah, go listen to the. Uh, 124B episode of uh, the Experimental Brewing Podcast. Happy holidays, because Denny opens it up with Christmas Island, and that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> when I asked when I asked Drew what he thought, he said, "Well, it was scary." <laughs> <laughs> now, now, by the way, hopefully, uh, just so everybody knows, I mean, like, even though Denny and I are giving each other rafts of shit back and forth this is this is our working relationship and we love each other it is not violent it is not you know <laughs> it is not contentious I've heard, I've heard a rumor that you guys have been collaborating on stuff since 20 2012 at least has it been that uh, long i don't know I, I think i i think i heard actually i think it's been longer but yeah i think that maybe the first book was around that time well, well. So the important thing yeah, to realize that, about the first book, the first book was like two years in the making. Yes. Yeah. So and the next that, one was like six months, and then the third one was like also six months. I think it was just. No, it was it was a couple of years. Christy gave us a lot of time on that one. Was it? I can't tell. Or anymore. she said she, she said she was going to, but um, yeah, to, to, yeah, time I'm, time doesn't matter anymore. It's it's interesting because Drew is about the same age as my son. And uh, having having a business partner who's the same age of your son makes for an interesting dynamic, but it also explains why he's always wrong. <laughs> except for except for all the times I have you on the podcast, I am right. So shush, well, shush, old man. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise, I'm going to pack you off to the old folks' home. Even a broken clock. <laughs> Children, children, children. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, look, so look, one of my favorite memories of this whole stupidity that Danny and I've been doing is after we released the the experimental homebrewing book, we uh, we got invited to go down to Brazil to go talk at a conference there, and it's it's very important for people to understand. Like, if you read our books, you should be able to hear our voices in it, and you should actually be able to hear this same sort of conversational style it's it's very much a thing that we aim for whenever we're writing yeah. um and so we knew we had done it right when the morning after we arrived in brazil after a 31 hour flight um we got onto a minibus with a bunch of brazilian homebrewers to take us around breweries in their area and also a distillery which was nice um yeah. and Denny and I were up at the front of the bus as honored guests or some such, and we were just jawing back and forth like we normally do. And somebody behind us, and Denny, you remember this better than I do, but what somebody behind us just whispered to somebody else is like, it, it's, it's like the like book the comes book is, yeah, the book has come to life, you know. <laughs> it's like the, the, the book is just 
our lives you know that's just the way it is yeah. so, uh, so uh, drew and Denny, i gotta thank you guys for coming out here this evening and uh, really brightening our day there were a lot of shit that happened this day and uh and uh this seems like a a, a better way to end the day than you know, uh, looking at what's going on. Yeah, I, I wanted to, I want to second that emotion. Um, I am so glad that there, that I have the Society of Barley Engineers to help make up for the, the day that we've had today. It's been uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, welcome, welcome relief. And thank you guys so much for, for joining us. It's been great. Uh, it was, it was great to have an out for a couple hours, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, Absolutely. yeah, I, I will tell you guys, I don't think uh, in this past year of fun that we've had, I honestly don't think I've ever appreciated having a homebrew club more than I've had none had during this period because uh, they've actually kind of helped uh, kind of help keep everything grounded. Yeah, it's it's nice having that 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 common ground with a bunch of great people and mm -hmm. uh, even though we can't see each other in person and uh, shake hands and hug and all that, it's a uh, it's a great way to get back to to uh, something that we really love, and it's so that's good. Absolutely. Well, and I will even say the I think the other value is I'm I think most of us have lived our lives under uh, under a period of time where uh, uh, things weren't as divisive and as puritanical in a lot of ways from a political point of view. And so one of the other the things I appreciate about the homebrew clubs is I can go hang out with people here. And, um, and I know in my club, I've got a lot of my friends in the club who have radically different political beliefs than I do. And even though all the media and everything else would want you to have you to believe that and political rhetoric uh, would want to have you believe that, uh, that you should not mix being in the homebrew club together reminds me that there is a good common ground for everything else. So there you go. Absolutely. Yep. No. thanks Beer. again everybody thank you guys beer is uh, peace well, how about it how about a song to finish what do you think yes. denny do, you, go, do your thing go, go go listen to christmas island please don't make me do it i haven't played oh. that ukulele in six months oh yeah. goodness. <laughs> okay <laughs> all right guys thanks a lot thank, thank you, you guys thank take you. care bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Thank, you. thank you thank you man appreciate thanks. it thanks All right. Good stuff. Dinner time. <laughs> I'm all ready to go, except I haven't played.